Richard's going to come here to say a few words, but before he comes up, I just want to say, you know, in the world of real estate, um, the Lefrac name, and specifically Richard Lefrac, it's a world champion of uh, names. It's an iconic name in the world of development. And we're very happy to have him here today. And, you know, this thing that they've created here, it's, it's taken incredible, incredible vision to, uh, to build something like this. You know, I just want you guys to imagine that you're driving across America and somebody offers you 600 acres in the middle of America to build something. And uh, you say to yourself, yes, I'm going to do this. I'm going to bet my family's resources. I'm going to put my own capital, and I'm going to bet my legacy on creating something like this here in the middle of nowhere. Now, imagine that, but imagine that 600 acres in Jersey, right? <laughs> right? Where there was a lot of stigma with Jersey in the 1980s, and that uh, they had the vision and the wherewithal to say, we're going to create something here on this land in the 1980s. I mean, today you're seeing something different, but you have to see the depth of this vision and how far back it went and what it took to take that kind of a risk. And I think it's admirable because, you know, there's very few people and few builders that can come in here. Every builder, every developer wants to make money. That goes without saying. But it takes few builders who say that I want to make a change. I want to create a city. I want to create a village. I want to create a community. That's more important than anything else. And of course, if you're able to do that, the money will come with it. And I think the Lefracs are pretty, probably pretty happy with this whole thing. So with, uh, without saying anything else, uh, please put your hands together for Richard Lefrac. Thank you, Amir. Thank you so much for being here today, and thank you for taking the time to watch the video. As you saw, this has been an undertaking that is not only important to me, but to three generations of my family. If we were to have held this conference in 1985, probably only a handful of people would have shown up. So looking at the hundreds and hundreds of people in attendance is really satisfying. I know there are dignitaries and elected officials and community leaders here. Rather than enlisting everyone, I will say thank you for being here and for all your support over the years. What started with a phone call four decades ago has become the wonderful community we are in today. This afternoon is certainly about honoring the vision, but it is also a chance to recognize so many other people who were instrumental to the successes that we've seen at Newport. The nine mayors and nine governors, that's 18 different administrations. And I challenge anyone here to name all 18 without referring to Google. I want to thank the tens of thousands of construction workers, the millions of hours of, by these men and women made everything we see here possible. And by and large, this was a union development, okay? The city planners, city staff, and city leaders that have worked with us, supported us, and helped us make this place better over the years. And of course, my wonderful colleagues at Lafrac and Simon, many of whom are no longer with us, they too deserve recognition for their tremendous work. Uh, you all saw from the video what Jersey City was as we began to embark on this historic development. No infrastructure, and challenging environmental conditions. But, but, it was an oasis of untapped potential. We were able to take these abandoned rail yards and piers in the late 1980s and change it into a catalyst for the realization of what money.com calls one of the 10 best cities to live in in the entire country. And we continue to build and develop without displacing one single person. Transformational is a word too often used by developers. However, we can truly say and know that together we transformed Jersey City into one of the most desired American cities in which to work, live, and play. I'm so proud of what my family has accomplished, beginning with my father Sam and continuing with my sons Harrison and Jamie, in addition to our great partners, the Simon family. 
It's miraculous what we've been able to build here and make no mistake about it, we're just getting started. Our goal was to make sure Newport became a world-class place to work and live. We are proud to be able to lead the effort to make this happen, but the work is not yet completed. There are still many years of development that needs to happen at Newport. And while I'm optimistic about Newport's future, the coming years, and the decisions made by the leadership in Jersey City will play an important role in shaping that future. In Jersey City, we need better schools so that residents want to stay and raise their families. The state and city need tax incentives, not tax increases, to bring jobs and opportunities to the city and state. The Port Authority of New York and New Jersey will need to keep the path train service levels con consistent with the growth that we are seeing in Jersey City. And we have to address congestion pricing because we know that will cause even more demand and stress on the PATH system. And finally, New Jersey needs to invest in getting residents to workplaces in New Jersey and not other states. One such investment is the North Jersey traffic bypass. Like much of the story of Newport and the growth of Jersey City that we see today, it will take a collective effort to achieve the goals that we are setting forth. I've never been more excited about what's to come for the Newport community. I thank you all for coming out today and for your continued support. And if you haven't gone and looked around Newport for yourself, I highly recommend that you do so. Go out and see the life that's been spurred into this community. The buildings, the art, the food, the shopping, and more importantly, go out and meet the people. They too are a part of our success. Thank you. Richard, thank you for that. Um, when, when you get started on a project this size, who are the first people that you have to get on board? You, you and your father, you said, we're going to do this thing. And there was, I know you guys use your own money and your own resources, but there were people that you had to get on board. Who are the first people that you had to get well, on board you, on doing something like you, this? Obviously, you need the, the cooperation of the city fathers. I mean, you, you have to get your entitlements. You have to get all the infrastructure and all the, uh, you know, fundamentals, you know, organized or else there's no chance to go forward. So uh, it happened at the time when we started this thing, uh, Mayor McCann, who some of you may remember his name, he's still around, I think, uh, was very pro-development because Jersey City had been struggling for many years, losing population, and uh, he wanted to get, the, get some project, projects going here. And uh, so he was, you know, he and his administration were very helpful in the beginning. But if you don't have cooperation from the city fathers, and you know, you're not going to get anything done. But this, this whole project site came to you guys in one piece, right? And the city and the state wanted... Well, the, the project actually, no, the, we, we, the land was owned by many, many people, but mostly it was the railroads that owned it. And many of the railroads were in financial difficulty or bankrupt. Uh, but the city had agreed on a general redevelopment plan for this site, and so we were able to purchase from a variety of owners the basic uh, uh, assemblage that this project has been developed on. And then, so when the city came to you guys and you guys started putting the, all the pieces together for it, um, was there any time during this period where you were like, oh my God, what have we done? We're going to be busy with this thing for the next 50 years. Well, originally we said 20, so <laughs> that's, that's, we, we, we didn't get that right. Um, you know, in the beginning it was very daunting, I have to say. It didn't, wasn't all that obvious. Uh, we, uh, you know, people were thinking we were crazy, actually. You know, people were saying, why, why would they go to Jersey City? We were building in New York. We were successful. We had lots of real estate over there. But, uh, you know, over time, we were able to build a critical mass, but that took many, many years. Right. Yeah. Many, many years. And then uh, when, at any time during the last uh, 40 years, how many times did the vision for the project overall change? Uh, in the beginning, it was frequent. I mean, we kept deciding. 
the, the interesting thing about the project was that there were certain things that we couldn't play with. You had the Holland Tunnel running through the project and the path trains running under the project. So obviously you couldn't build on top of the tunnel and you couldn't build on top of the trains. So where the streets were laid out and you know, kind of where the fundamental utilities and everything were, were kind of dictated somewhat by the infrastructure that was lying underneath the ground. Uh, Jersey City at that time had a huge problem uh, with their storm sewers. And so one of the things that we did originally was uh, we uh, created a, a system of uh, improving the storm sewers. So instead of water coming from the river into the city, yeah. it went the other way. Right, right. So, uh, the, you know, but again, in the beginning, it was all very expensive. A lot of money was, you know, coming out of the, you know, out of the developers' pockets, but there was no income coming. If you had the technology that Hudson Yards did, uh, where they were able to build on top of the train tracks, that would have obviously changed the vision and it would have probably sped things up? Uh, no, not really, because, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, it, 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 it's different kind of subsurface problems here yeah. than that they had there. Because there the train, train was at grade level and then they built basically over the train tracks. In this case, the train and the tunnel were underneath the ground. Right. So we had to build around them. And then if that, was there any technology that's come out in the last uh, 10, 20 years that would have helped you guys speed up the process? Uh, well, that I, th changed I think things? there's been a tremendous improvement in construction techniques. I mean, some things have improved a great deal with uh, computer-aided design and more integrated planning and everything that, that people do today. Uh, in the beginning, some of those tools, sophisticated tools, weren't available to us. But, uh, you know, a lot of it, as far as the planning goes, you know, we were kind of feeling our way as to what would work. Uh, and, you know, where we put the mall, where the residential communities were gonna be located, where the office buildings were gonna be located, it was a little bit of a moving target in the beginning. It, it's, it was interesting when we were talking earlier, you were saying, uh, when I was asking you if there was any time that you regretted the project, he was like, well, it's all about timing in real estate because, you know, 40 years ago, people could have said that this was not the brightest thing to do. And, uh, you know, today, a lot of people could argue that the commercial buildings that you built in Manhattan are not the smartest thing no. to do. Oh, they're in trouble so, now. But, I thought, but how long did it take before you guys saw, after all the money that you spent in the project initially, how long did it take before you guys saw dollar one? Well, dollar one was we saw when we finished the first four buildings in the um, mall. But we never saw dollar one in the pocket for probably 15 years, so we didn't. We probably didn't see any money till about 2000. Actually, dividends that we could that we could take out because the money constantly had to be reinvested in infrastructure and 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 developing the next sites and so forth. 15 years is a long time, especially when investors these days are expecting returns in you know five to uh, seven years. Did you guys uh, did you guys expect it to take that long, or were you prepared for it, or were you like we're already pregnant, let's move forward? Well, kind of the last. <laughs> yeah, we you know we were kind of pregnant with the with the idea, and you know I mean we didn't expect that this thing would be an immediate success, even though I think we had fairly good consumer take up, but uh, you know it took a while for it to mature, and we were prepared for it. We had the capital, and we did go through also several business cycles that you know, occurred during the course of this uh, development. I mean, if you think about it, uh, you know, we had uh, uh, recessions in 86, 87, and 92, 93, mm -hmm. 98, 2003, 2008. I mean, you know, so you also have to remember you're doing something in a very long period of time and business conditions are gonna change dramatically through those uh, business cycles. Uh, you know, doing a project like this, obviously you have to have the support of the politicians, uh, state and uh, city politicians. How do you secure the promises that, you know, people are making to you and the promises you're making to them and making sure that they stay the same as these elected officials change as you're going through the process? Uh, good question, and I don't actually have a good answer for it. But I would say 
in general, uh, you went through nine governors, right? Throughout uh, this we process? went through a lot of governors and a lot of mayors, and some were much much more pro development, and others were not, and some actually opposed what we were doing, uh, especially in the beginning, because it was such a big change for Jersey City. Some of the local politicians were quite disturbed that we were going to change the nomenclature of of Jersey City, but. Uh, in, in general, they respect what they've done in the past, but they like to change it. Uh, case in point, the tax incentives for the uh, commercial development here mm -hmm. changed dramatically. Uh, Florio w was the governor who, uh, who originally uh, encouraged it, and over the course of a number of years, they've been eroded dramatically. But uh, you, there, there's, so there's no real way to secure it. The mayor today comes and makes a promise to you, or the governor. There's no well, sure I, way I, that you I, can hold I, them. I, I don't want to say that they don't live up to their commitments, but sometimes they have a way of modifying what they tell you. <laughs> you know, the, the electorate, the city council, they have their reasons that, and they can hold you up. I mean, the building department can hold you up. They have lots of tools in their toolbox to to oppose you if they want to oppose you. But I have to say, in general, we've gotten reasonable cooperations from the city officials in Jersey Were City. Were you in the position where, you know, the new elected uh, official came into office and they said, well, we're changing this. And you're like, well, you know, this was promised to me by the last four guys. And uh, now we're at the stage where we have to, we yeah, actually that, need this. That's been more of a problem at the state than the city, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the state policies have changed and you know, sometimes that happens, you know, economic development, sometimes it's the environmental protection issues that they, they get more stringent or they change things. Just as a matter of, uh, you know, this was a brownfield and they had no uh, regulatory framework to, um, to uh, you know, basically control how you develop on a brownfield of this size. It didn't exist in New Jersey, so it was kind of invented at this site, how, how we dealt with all the all environmental problems. And over time, different administrations either lightened up or got more strict about how they wanted it done. And has it worked in your favor where something you were able to go and say, I know we agreed to this, but we want to modify it for whatever reason? Uh, I, we haven't been too good at that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, was there ever a need to do that, to modify it? Well, sure, we always go and ask for certain consideration, but, you know, they, they, they're public officials and they, 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 they guard their prerogatives very closely. They do. But we, we overcame it. I mean, you know, whatever opposition it was, if you look out in the window, you can see that we were able to overcome it. And you guys generally tend to do these very large-scale projects, like Lafrac City was a massive project, the Battery Park City project that you guys, that you, you did the first six buildings in Battery Park. This project is obviously massive. Are those the only kinds of uh, projects that you look to do now? Are those the only things that really move the needle for Lafrac? Hmm. No, I, I mean, we, we, we're open to, to everything, but when you get involved in these big projects, they take a lot of attention and time, they do. We still have 22 really excellent building sites here. Mm -hmm. So if somebody comes to us with a project, you know, we always have to lay it up against what we have already in our inventory. Now we do have, a, we're doing a huge project now in Miami called Solomia, which is 5,000 apartments and a million and a half feet of a commercial space, but again, it's the same thing. We, while we're open to a lot of ideas, we normally, you know, we always have to lay it up against the opportunities we have already. But, but it does have to be a certain size for you to get excited about it. it well, outside it, of yes. the one hotel yes, that does, you did. It does, it does, yes, it, it's not, you know, an isolated building isn't gonna turn us on at this point. <laughs> or me, anyway. So you, you've been at this uh, project for a long time now. Is, is there a time when you think, is there a deadline on this where you're like, we're finally done with this, on to the next one? Uh, well, I, we originally, I thought this was going to take 20 years. We're now in year 35. I don't see it, it getting done before 50 years. What do you guys think, Harrison, Jamie, what do you guys think? Yeah, <laughs> Well, I'll bring my grandchildren and they can hear the, uh, you know, finish up. Um, 
I, I guess we only have a few minutes left. Uh, but Richard, if you had a message for, obviously you've poured a lot of resources and money into Jersey City, into New Jersey. For that kind of investment to come into uh, New Jersey or Jersey City or the waterfront, what message would you have for the politicians uh, in order to get that kind of money to travel all the way across the river and to come land here? What kind, of, what kind of a message would you have for the politicians so that they could welcome more of that capital coming here? Well, I, I would tell the politicians that not el every developer is a devil, really, because in all, often that's right now, the politicians, many of them, feel that it, you, you're, if you're a developer, you're here to take advantage or, you know, to, uh, to create the value for yourself and not anybody, not the community. And I would hearken to what happened here in Jersey City as a good example. You know, yes, we didn't come here out of completely altruism. We came here to try to make some money. I, I apologize if that happened. But the whole city really blossomed after we got started because people recognized that there was real value here and that creates jobs and it creates taxes and it creates economic activity and it also creates the life that people have. They, I always, people say to me, what, how do you measure your success here? And I say, baby carriages. Uh -huh. Because when families come and move here, I know I've done, we've done a great job because people don't want to live someplace with their children unless they know it's safe and nice and clean and good and that they have a nice community. And so those things, those are imponderables and it's hard to think that every developer is thinking like that, but I would say to my colleagues in the development business, if you don't think like that, you're being a fool. You don't, you're a fool if you don't think about the bigger picture. If, uh, I, you know, you guys invest in a lot of gateway cities like New York, you know, Jersey City, obviously, Miami, Los Angeles. What is, uh, are you interested in some of the newer markets that became really hot during the pandemic, like Nashville and Dallas well, and places we, we, like that? We've, we've, we've looked at, in Texas, we've looked in Tennessee, we, we have. Uh, and yes, you know, in North Carolina, we've, we've looked and, you know, there's a chance that we'll go find something of interest and scale that we'll go down and, and, and take an interest in. But again, everything is measured against the inventory of current opportunities that we have and we own a lot of interesting opportunities here in Jersey City and also now in Miami so you know uh, the, my organization is great the fabulous staff of people two fabulous sons who are much smarter than I am uh, but you know you only have time as one asset that you can't expand and so how you spend your time always has to be the thing that's the most productive to, to you to you personally and so I don't want to just race off to Tennessee or race off to Texas when I have wonderful things that I can still address myself to that I care about. And this project here, I care desperately about because I think it's just so uh, rewarding for me when I walk around here and I see kind of what we've done. Yeah, I, I love seeing your excitement about this because when we just uh, saw each other earlier, you took me to all the windows and showed me like the different buildings and you're super excited about it, which is nice. Do you believe that this project or this, you know, this entire project will be your personal legacy? No, no. I, 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 first of all, I consider it a family legacy, not my personal legacy. Uh, uh, and also the Simons who have been great partners and involved from the beginning as well. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I kind of, this was my baby for 40 years, so, you know, I guess I do feel a little pride of uh, authorship. Well, uh, I think uh, they just told me to get off, so I'm going to have to leave. But, uh, Richard, any final words for the audience? Well, I've just, uh, this place is a great place for all the developers and investors. Keep investing and keep developing. It's only going to get better. Thank you, guys. Before you leave, we have uh, you know, you know, one of the most important things we can all do as uh, citizens and residents of these communities is uh, to get involved and uh, vote. Not everybody can have the impact that uh, Richard has uh, with his checkbook going into a community and being able to change things. But uh, what we can do is 
being able to go out there and actually vote. With that, with that said, we're very happy to have uh, Senator Menendez who is here today and he's gonna make a few remarks, come up on stage. And a great friend at a project too.